Hello and welcome to episode one of the Vegan Bootcamp series, the series in which we will be going through Vegan Bootcamp, which is an online vegan course designed to help people with going vegan or just to inform people about veganism. Uh, this is the Vegan Bootcamp homepage, and in case you didn't know, Vegan Bootcamp is a project of the vegan hacktivists, who are a global community of passionate animal advocates offering our skills in building technology for the animal protection movement through the design, development, and data. As I started becoming more involved with veganism and becoming a little bit more of an activist, I felt that it was really important for me to be as educated and informed as possible. And sort of as I was exploring that, I remembered that this website exists and I figured if I'm gonna do it, I might as well film it and put it on the internet for other people to potentially benefit from. So this is gonna be mostly me doing these courses out loud so you can follow along, maybe learn something new. So this video is going to be for anybody who wants to learn more about veganism or just wants like a vegan hangout. Anybody is welcome here. So this here is the homepage and anybody can sign up. It was very easy. You can do it with Google. And yeah, so it is, uh, looks like it's 25 subjects like nutrition, recipes, philosophy, climate, cosmetics, welfare, budgeting, clothing, family, and many more. So I'm obviously not going to be doing all of these in one video. So like I said, this is going to be a series. So we're just going to go through some of the first ones today. All right, so here we are at the first lesson. So this is the welcome, and it starts with this quote that I do enjoy, which is, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And that is Jeremy Bentham. All right, so this is the course page, and it looks like there's going to be quizzes, and also something that's interesting is they have these course discussions. It doesn't look like they're super active, but I do still think it is a neat feature. So I am going to skip this first section because I'm actually not sure if this is still associated with um, Earthling Ed and Surge Sanctuary or Surge as a company in general. So we are going to skip that one just in case. But let's jump right in and start with how does Vegan Bootcamp work? So. There's around 30 courses that you can complete for Vegan Bootcamp with an additional 100 plus bonus lessons to explore. Each course consists of reading material, images, statistics, videos, quizzes, and actions. Read each lesson thoroughly, watch the videos provided, then click continue. Each course will give you an action to take ranging from finding a local vegan restaurant to making your own plant-based milk. Um, how long is Vegan Bootcamp? While the bootcamp was originally designed as a 30-day program, you can take each course at your own pace, whether that's one course a day or several. The important thing to remember is that even though this is exciting, you should take it at a pace that's not overwhelming, but rather whatever feels most comfortable to you. This greatly increases the chances of you being able to stick to veganism for the long run. All right, so what are the stars and how do I earn them? As you complete challenges, you'll earn stars that you can use to redeem coupons. Our rewards store is where you'll be able to spend these stars by unlocking discounts at participating vegan stores and organizations. You can click the star at the top right of any page to begin browsing the store. All right, and so at the bottom here, I like this. So it says note, all content in Vegan Bootcamp has sources provided at the bottom of the page or linked within the content. We encourage you to look into all sources that we link with scrutiny. That is something that I was wondering about when I was getting back into this. So I'm glad that they provide them in a way that is so easy to access because I think that that is an important part of this. All right, so this section is called why people are going vegan. There's various reasons that lead people towards veganism for the animals. Long before the health and environmental benefits were clear, people have been going vegan solely for moral reasons as we kill 56 billion animals per year. Anyone who admires or adores animals has probably, at some point in their lives, questioned whether there is any difference between the animals they care for and those we kill for food. While exploiting animals for food in other ways may have been necessary in our past, we now live in a world where we can thrive without the need of hurting or killing animals. Alright, and then the next one is for the environment. 
As the impact of accelerating climate change have become more widely publicized, the need for us to take steps to curb the destruction of our precious planet have become abundantly clear. Animal agriculture is a leading factor contributing to environmental destruction. <laughs> Excuse me. And the facts are so compelling. <laughs> I need some water. that anyone seeking to live a more sustainable lifestyle cannot help but question what the impact their food choices have. And then for your health. Many people who turn vegan are drawn to it because they hear or read about the tremendous long-term health benefits of eliminating animal products from their lives. In recent years, the health argument for veganism has gained a lot of traction as several scientific studies have confirmed that you don't need to consume animal products to be healthy. In fact, the largest and most renowned health and nutrition organizations around the world have declared veganism to be healthy or even healthier. So I think this page is pretty interesting because there's a lot of discussion, I think, around if veganism isn't primarily motivated by animals, is it even veganism? And it's hard to say because obviously if somebody is doing it for their health, we'll typically call them plant-based, and even for the environment, you'd call them plant-based because um, both of those motivations don't necessarily um, like spur you into performing veganism to its fullest. Like for example, for the environment, like you might still buy secondhand leather, or you might, you know, not be opposed to going to a zoo, whereas somebody who's vegan wouldn't do either of those things. And of course, for your health, it's also obvious. So I think it's interesting that they include for the environment and for your health. But I guess, like I said, this is for people who are sort of starting with veganism. So it could make sense from that perspective. All right, at the bottom, they say your reasons. Most people turn to veganism because of a combination of the above factors. Ultimately, the path you choose to get to veganism doesn't matter. What truly matters is that you start. Let me know in the comments how you came to veganism and if you consider yourself vegan, do you do it like mainly for animals or mainly for the environment or entirely for your health? I'm curious about the interplay of um, those three factors for you. Okay, quiz. What did you learn? So what is veganism? Okay, so we have a whole food, oh, there's something interesting. Okay, a whole foods plant-based diet that excludes any animal products whatsoever. B, a lifestyle excluding all forms of cruelty to animals, not just a diet as far as practicable. C, a diet that excludes meat and dairy, but not eggs or honey. A satanic cult to promote the extreme view of not harming animals. All right, so it's gonna be B. All right. And then what can you do with stars? For like, okay, I'm just gonna exchange them at the end of the challenge. Spend them. Yep, this is the one. Wait. Yep. I think it's C. Sorry, I didn't read those aloud because they were just about the function of the website. All right, I've completed the introduction. Now it's time to take action. Now that the introduction is over, you're ready to begin your first challenge. All right, click the button below to confirm you're ready to begin. And then we'll have a total of 50 stars. We'll see you at the first challenge, which is dairy. All right, done. Complete this course. All right, so that one's done. So here we can actually see the overview of all the courses. So I'm gonna do these chronologically, but obviously if you do it on your own time, you can do them in whatever order that you like. So we're gonna jump right back in with dairy here. Okay. Overview of the dairy industry. So again, if you're vegan, I don't know if I've already said this, but if I haven't, if you're vegan, you probably already know a lot of this information. But like I said, a little bit of brushing up is always a good thing. So let's jump in. Many people believe that cow's milk is essential in the human diet after years of the dairy industry promoting its product as healthy. However, there are a number of health risks associated with consuming it. We'll go over some of those risks in the next section. All right, then we've got a quote, which is, cow's milk is promoted as natural, wholesome, and healthy. It is none of these things. And that is from Dr. Justine Butler. And then, 
The saturated fat, animal protein, cholesterol, and hormones that it contains are linked to a wide range of illnesses and diseases. Aggressive marketing of milk and dairy products has resulted in confusion. People simply don't know what to believe. Most people in the world, over 70%, are lactose intolerant. No other animal on the planet continues to drink milk after weaning, let alone the milk of a pregnant mother from another species. It begs the question, are we asking for trouble? Yeah, I was never a dairy fan. It always like made my throat super phlegmy and I avoided it um, as best I could for a very long time. Uh, even before going vegan, it just um, gave me the ick. All right, so here we go. The origins of dairy farming. Humans have been drinking milk for only six to 8,000 years. This might sound like a very long time, but in evolutionary terms, it is very recent history. If the whole of modern human history was represented by just 12 hours, humans would have started dairy farming just one minute ago. I did not know that, so that is very interesting information. All right, milking the cash cow. Just like us, cows don't produce milk unless they've given birth. It's amazing how many people don't know that. Their children are taken away, and then the milking begins. The modern dairy cow is routinely impregnated while she is still producing milk to extend the milking period and keep the yield high. The only breather she gets is a small respite, respite. <laughs> sorry, I don't say that word out loud very often, near the end of her pregnancy. At least two thirds of cow's milk in the UK is taken from pregnant cows, which makes it a rich cocktail of hormones designed to help a young calf grow rapidly into an adult cow in just one year. This is not just limited to the UK, but standard for most countries in the world. An intensive cycle of repeated pregnancies follows until she is worn out and her productivity drops, after which she is slaughtered and sold for cheap meat. This intensive physical demand puts a tremendous strain on the dairy cow, and as she gets older, infertility and severe infections causing mastitis and lameness cut her life short. The average lifespan of a modern dairy cow is now only about five years, after three or four lactations when she would naturally live 20 to 30 years. Okay, so to summarize, the dairy cows are frequently milked when pregnant. And let's see, why did it say that? So it extends the milking. So she's routinely impregnated while still producing milk, which extends the milking period and keeps the yield high. All right. And so two thirds of the cow's milk is taken from pregnant cows. That's that's just gross. <laughs> I mean, I know it's not about being gross, but it also just is gross. And I'm interested in the difference between the amount of hormones in a non-pregnant cow's milk and a pregnant cow's milk, if there's a difference there, because it kind of makes it sound like there is. All right, so they only live about five years, and in five years, they get pregnant three to four times and have three to four babies taken away. And normally they would live 20 to 30 years. Okay. All right, so what lies beneath? Cow's milk is perfect for calves, but not for people. The same is true of the milk of buffaloes, badgers, dogs, and rats. The best milk for babies is human breast milk. Cow's milk contains more than twice as much protein and four times as much calcium as human milk, which makes it ideal fuel for rapid growth. Human babies grow much more slowly, but our brain development is rapid, which is why breast milk contains five times as much brain-boosting polyunsaturated fat as a cow's milk. Milk also carries important chemical messenger molecules that instruct the infant's immune system. These features have evolved over thousands of years and are vital in terms of health and disease. Okay. Interesting. So it has unsaturated five times as much unsaturated fast cows okay so that's human milk okay because the human infants need more fat because of the increased speed of the brain development it seems like and then milk carries important chemical messenger molecules that instruct the infant's immune system so is that saying that the cow milk if given to a human alters our immune systems that would be interesting so yeah i actually think that this part is a little bit unclear about like why they're giving us this information because it's kind of sounding like they're trying to say to give human babies 
human milk instead of cow's milk, which I think is not necessarily relevant to like the average person who's going vegan. But nonetheless, it was interesting and let us move on. All right, so now we're gonna get into the cruel cycle to produce dairy. Forcefully impregnated and separated. One of the dairy industry's biggest misconception is the very nature in which cows produce milk. It still surprises many to hear that in order to produce milk, a cow first needs to be pregnant, just like us, and that she needs to give birth every year to meet the demands of our high yield modern dairy farming cycle. Following a nine month pregnancy, the calf is typically removed from his or her mother within 48 hours. The cows receive synthetic milk alternatives so that the mother's milk can produce more money for farmers' pockets. The industry argues that this is for the health of the calf. They say that they can better measure the amount of colostrum, a form of milk-containing antibodies to protect newborns against disease. The calf drinks if it is given artificially. In reality, it's simply so we, as a human society, can steal all of her milk for our own consumption. It's just so evil. It's so evil. It's really terrible to, to read about. <sighs> All right. Terrible photo. Terrible photo. All right. So the next subheading is pain and isolation for everyone involved. The separation process is a painfully emotional experience with mother cows bellowing for days, looking for their lost babies. The female calves or the replacement milking herd are shifted to isolated hutches. Think outdoor dog kennel. Sometimes just meters away from their mothers. Here, they'll legally spend up to eight weeks before being transferred to group housing with other young females awaiting a life sentence of suffering. It is not uncommon, however, to find calves up to six months of age still living in isolation, struggling to get inside the hard plastic hutches designed for much smaller animals. Interesting. <sighs> I haven't heard of uh, the replacement milking herd. I haven't heard that exact term before. All right. Mother cows have been known to scream for their young, attempting to break out of their pens, break down fences, and go to other extreme lengths in their desperation for reunification. They want to spend time with their offspring. In fact, cows often bound, bond with their mothers for life, remaining in the same herd when allowed to live naturally. The extreme distress these cows demonstrate often lead them to refuse food and water. They get sick, become malnourished, and are impregnated again within three or four months. The cycle continues with each new baby being taken away from his or her mother. It's just like, when you empathize even a little bit with what they experience in their lives, it's just disgusting that people do this to them. Um, if you're watching this and you haven't seen Dominion for some reason, please go watch Dominion. It is a very eye-opening documentary about the way that humanity um, commodifies and uses and exploits animals. The link for that will be down in the description. Please go watch if you haven't or send the link to somebody who hasn't if you already have. All right. Living in crowded and packed lots. Have you ever developed a sudden panicked feeling in a crowded room, such as at a concert? Imagine living in that environment for your entire life. If you watch cows in their natural environments, you'll notice that they spread out. Even, I don't know how to say this word, heifers, I'm sorry, heifers, give their calves near immediate autonomy. The mother will check with the baby frequently, but also allow the calf to roam. Similarly, although cows are intensely social creatures, you'll see that they keep space between each other unless there's a reason to come together. Cows might spend a few minutes grooming each other, for instance, then amicably, amicably amble away. It's almost a tongue twister. Dairy cows don't get those luxuries. They live in small pens with no room and no pleasure. They never get the opportunity to explore their world naturally, and many develop serious illnesses and other conditions because they're kept in such close quarters. <sighs> It's always especially frustrating to see on like TikTok, for example, all those farmers who will pretend like they have these happy animals and they care about their animals. 
because it's just so not true. But people are happy to believe it because of course change is hard. So it's easier to believe that the cows are happy and that you can just like keep drinking milk and eating cake and well, eating non-vegan cake, obviously, um, because that's what people are used to. And going against the social norm is very challenging for a lot of people. So yeah, those TikTok farmers just make my blood boil. All right, here we go. Next subheading. Born to suffer and die needlessly. If the calf is born male, he becomes a useless byproduct sold for cheap meat, beef as well as veal, or killed on farm. The young calf, for example, at the center of a 2011 Viva campaign's investigation into dairy farms, supplying Cadbury was shot in the head on the back of a truck and his body handed over to the local foxhounds for food. He was just one of an estimated 95,000 calves that met their end this way in the UK every year. The perpetual cycle of forced pregnancies, swift separations from their young, as well as unnaturally high milk yields undoubtedly take their toll. For at least seven months of the year, she is both pregnant and lactating from a previous pregnancy, visiting the milk parlor twice a day to release an average of 14 liters at a time. That's approximately 28 liters of milk a day. Having been pro through the process three to four times by the age of five or six, she is exhausted and experiencing a complete body breakdown. The fuel her body needs to meet the demands of intensive dairy farming simply cannot be met, and the reason why dairy herds are often found looking emaciated with their pelvic floor bones, spine, and ribs, ribs almost sticking right through their skin. Yeah, this is also interesting because people like to like insist that the cows walk to go be milked. And it's like, yeah, because it's probably super uncomfortable to have 14 liters of milk in your body. Like that sounds terrible. Like just because they, you know, find that is more comfortable after having been milked doesn't mean that they like having that much milk in them or the process that gets them there or the actual milking itself. Ridiculous. All right, here we go. Exhausted, exploited, then killed. If you've read this far, you have a pretty good understanding of what dairy cows endure on a daily basis. It's a continuous cycle that involves each cow's daughters, sons, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. No animal, dairy cows included, is built to spend a life in confinement. Cows need to roam, explore the world, find fresh grass, locate water sources, and tend their young. By treating them like lactose vending machines, factory farmers destroy the animal spirits and prevent them from experiencing the world as they were intended. Unfortunately, millions of cows endure this treatment, but there's nobody to save them. The dairy cow is arguably the hardest worked of all farmed animals. Forced into a perpetual cycle of dual pregnancy and lactation, confined to live more than half the year in barren sheds and fed unnatural mixes of silage. Not being able to consume enough food to keep up with the demands of nurturing an unborn calf while still lactating from a previous pregnancy, whether it's zero grazed or not, leaves her in a constant state of metabolic hunger. It is therefore normal for cows to draw on their body reserves to meet these requirements, resulting in a coat rack appearance where her bones and spine protrude. Once her milk yield drops or pregnancy becomes difficult, she's ultimately sent to her death killed for cheap beef at a fraction of her natural 20-year lifespan. The milk, beef, and veal trades are all inextricably linked, but you can help end the abuse. This is no life for any animal. And then it says, wait, what about local, organic, and free range? Don't be misled by dairy products with pictures of happy cows running near quaint country barns and reassuring labels proclaiming organic or free range. Cows on typical organic and free-range farms often spend much of their time confined to crowded sheds or mud-filled pens, just as animals on conventional factory farms do. While the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, requires animals on so-called free-range farms to have access to outdoor areas, it doesn't specify how much time they must be allowed to spend outside or how much space they should be given. Cows on organic dairy farms can be kept in crowded sheds, mired in their own waste, much like cows on factory dairy farms do. They too are artificially impregnated every year, and their calves are taken from them soon after birth. 
Cows on organic farms often aren't given antibiotics, even when they're sick or when their udders become infected, something that happens often because medicated animals lose their organic status. So that is really interesting and something I didn't know about, even though I have um, previously learned about how local organic and free range is all like basically a scam. I didn't know that they don't even get medicated like when they're sick or have an infection because then they can't, you know, then farmers can't sell their flesh for as much money. So that is like thoroughly messed up. Uh, it's really unfortunate how some people will cling to that. They'll say, oh, I only buy uh, organic or free range. Like people really cling to that and it is not what they think it is. It really isn't. All right, carrying on. Unfortunately, when it comes to local, the farmers still have to make a profit from said cows to make a living while competing with bigger farms, which means cutting costs like with any other product. Local or not, cows still need to be forcibly impregnated to produce milk, still die to be sold for meat before they get close to living a full life, and male calves still get killed for veal production as they are useless to dairy farmers. A global analysis conducted by Sentience Institutes suggests over 90% of farmed animals worldwide live on factory farms. But the good news in all of this is that we don't need dairy to survive or even thrive. In the next section, we're going to be going over all of the wonderful, healthy alternatives to cow's milk. Yeah, all the organic and free-range stuff is just like one of those ridiculously... Um, successful marketing campaigns that people just buy into out of ignorance. All right, so here we go. We are moving on to the section called the health implications of dairy products. All right, this page presents a summary of Viva's extensive, fully researched scientific report called White Lies. All the facts presented are based on peer-reviewed, published research. Full list of sources here. All right, we're gonna start with acne. Cow's milk can increase our hormone levels, which have been proven to be linked to the cause of acne. This is observed to be even more consequential for teenagers. However, bodybuilders, powerlifters, strong men, and other strength athletes are also at risk due to the consumption of whey protein supplements. Allergies. Food allergies cause 10% of eczema and 5% of asthma cases. The most common food triggers for eczema are cow's milk and eggs. Cow's milk allergy affects 2% of infants under the age of 1. Alright, the most common food triggers for eczema. Okay. Alright, so food allergies cause 10% of eczema. And the most common food triggers of those 10% are cow's milk and eggs. Okay. However, a hypersensitive reaction to milk proteins can seriously affect the amount of iron in infants and young children. The proteins can induce hidden gastrointestinal bleeding that may lead to iron deficiency anemia, which may affect 40% of otherwise healthy looking infants. Okay, arthritis. Dairy products make symptoms worth, worse for some, while a low-fat vegan and gluten-free diet has been found to help others. Sulforaphanes, found in broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, have anti-inflammatory properties that may help against cartilage damage in osteoarthritis. A low-fat vegan diet can be a powerful, positive, drug-free way of limiting the painful symptoms caused by this disease. Cancer. One in two people born after 1960 in the UK will be diagnosed with some kind of cancer in their lifetime. Up to 40% of these cancers could be prevented by lifestyle changes. A poor diet may be responsible for a third of all cancer deaths and is the second largest preventable risk factor for cancer, coming close behind smoking. Western diets containing meat, dairy, sugar, and highly processed food products can increase the risk of cancer. On the other hand, whole food, plant-based diets, which are rich in fiber and antioxidants, lower the risk. The European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, EPIC, study found that vegans have a 19% lower risk of cancer than meat eaters. Fish eaters had a 12% lower risk and vegetarians 11% lower. The World Cancer Research Fund says that most diets are protective most diets that are productive against cancer are mainly made up from foods of plant origin. IGF-1 signaling trouble. 
Milk increases levels of the growth hormone IGF-1 in our bodies by stimulating its production in the liver. Increased IGF-1 levels are linked to cancers of the bowel, breast, and prostate. It may also transform pre-existing or benign tumors into a more aggressive form of cancer. Professor T. Colin Campbell, Jacob Gold Sherman, Professor... I don't know how to say that word. I don't know why I don't know. I'm going to say emeritus. I'm sorry. Please correct me. Of, of nutritional biochemistry at Cornell University says that IGF-1 may turn out to be a predictor of certain cancers in the same way that cholesterol is a predictor of heart disease. A study from the British Journal of Cancer found that vegan men had 9% lower IGF-1 levels than vegetarians or meat eaters. All right, bowel cancer. Bowel cancer is the second most common cancer in England and the third most common cause of cancer death. Hmm. Several lifestyle factors have been linked to it. A Western diet, physical inactivity, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. The links between diet, weight, and exercise, and bowel cancer are some of the strongest for any type of cancer and raised IGF-1 levels are implicated. Eating cheese, Butter, cream, ice cream, and other dairy foods not only increases IGF-1 levels, but also increases the risk of becoming overweight and developing diabetes, which increases the risk of bowel cancer. Dairy foods offer no benefits to good bowel health, while whole food, plant-based diets containing plenty of fruit and vegetables, and therefore fiber, are low in saturated fat, and low in saturated fat reduce the risk of bowel cancer. So this is what I knew about, and you know, it seems really obvious to me I mean, there's always like the burden of knowledge, right? It's like once you know something, it's hard to remember what it was like to not know it. And the bowel cancer one just makes so much sense. Like obviously, if you replace something, like animal products have no fiber in them. And fiber is so healthy for your bowels. It's like imperative for good bowel health. So yeah, that one I think is an important one that a lot of people uh, don't often think about. All right. So next we've got Crohn disease. I'm wondering if I should start kind of skipping through some of these. But you know, I guess that there aren't all that many. So Crohn's disease is linked to dairy foods via the MAP bacterium that causes John's disease in cattle. I don't know anything about Crohn's disease. Um, MAP infection is widespread among cattle and is found in commercial milk. Infection may incur from inhaling MAP in fine water spray from rivers contaminated with infected cow manure. That sounds disgusting. This could explain the clusters of crones that occur around cities with rivers such as Cardiff in Wales and Winnipeg in Minnesota, United States. Professor John Herman Taylor at St. George's Hospital Medical School in London has found MAP patients with Crohn disease from the UK, Ireland, US, Germany, and United Arab Emirates. Avoiding dairy may not ensure avoiding MAP exposure, although if there were fewer cattle, there would be less MAP in the environment. So that is truly gross, and that's not even one that you can avoid by being a vegan, so... Although, like they said, fewer cattle means less MAP bacteria in the wild, so that's still a win for veganism. Okay, breast cancer. Breast cancer rates in the UK have risen steeply since the 1970s. The So a lot of these things talk um, from the UK perspective, but I think that the UK diet and the US diet in particular, a lot of Western diets, um, honestly, have a lot in common with each other. So I think that there would be a lot of similarities when we're comparing diets. So just because it says UK, you know, take everything with a grain of salt and, but also recognize that they, the data that they're using is probably pretty compatible with populations outside of the UK. But surely also all this data can be found for a specific population, so just research that. It should be pretty easy to find if you are curious about uh, some of this data as it applies to specific populations. All right. Breast cancer rates in the UK have risen steeply since the 1970s. The lifetime risk is now one in eight. Only five to 10% of breast cancer cases are caused by genes. Five to 10, that's pretty low. 
I don't read out loud very often, so I'm not, I'm not very good at breath control. So that's something that I'm working on too. So sorry for the weird breathing. All right. Research from Harvard School of Public Health suggests that nearly a third of all breast cancer deaths in high-income countries are caused by preventable lifestyle factors. Alcohol, overweight slash obesity, lack of exercise. Women with breast cancer tend to have higher estrogen levels, and a typically meaty and dairy-rich Western-style diet increases the levels of these hormones. In fact, milk and dairy products are the main source of estrogens in our diet. So, this is something that I also wish more people knew about because especially people who complain about estrogen and soy products, um, that is so annoying because there's like literal estrogen in dairy and the numbers when it comes to the correlation between breast cancer and dairy, I mean, it feels uh, very overwhelming and the link seems very clear. So it's very baffling that um, there are companies who partner with like Susan G. Komen, which is like that pink ribbon breast cancer charity. They actually partner with like yogurt and dairy companies as like part of the charity, which is like ridiculous because there is such a connection between breast cancer and dairy. All right. Still in the breast cancer section. Changing diet could prevent or limit the progression of the disease as high fiber, low fat vegan diets may lower hormone levels. Soya foods can also reduce breast cancer risk and improve prognosis for women with the disease. A dairy-free plant-based diet can reduce the risk factors associated with breast cancer and may help those who have been diagnosed with the disease. So yeah, I wish they had said a little bit more about like the difference between the soy, like, uh, phytoestrogen, I think it's called, and the actual estrogen in milk. Because I'm pretty sure the way, way that it works is, like, the phytoestrogen, the way that, the reason that this helps people who have breast cancer or may help is because it actually can bind with the estrogen receptor, but it doesn't actually, I guess bind is the wrong word, but it can, like, interact with it, but it doesn't actually go through through. I'm not a scientist, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it can lower estrogen levels because it prevents your body from actually absorbing excess amounts of like actual like human bioavailable estrogen. All right. Prostate cancer. The lifetime risk of prostate cancer for men in the UK is also 1 in 8. Just 5 to 15% of prostate cancers are linked to genes. So, like breast cancer, the majority of cases are caused by environmental and or lifestyle factors. Obesity and lack of exercise increases the risk. Rates are higher in countries consuming a typical Western diet. Men who eat lots of saturated animal fats, red meat such as beef, lamb, pork, eggs, butter, whole milk, cheese, and cream, have an increased risk of getting the disease. Diets high in calcium and dairy protein may also increase the risk of prostate cancer. Cow's milk protein increases IGF-1 levels, a known risk factor for prostate cancer. It has also been suggested that regular exposure to estrogen in milk from pregnant cows may explain the increased risk of prostate cancer in Western societies. On the positive side, a plant-based diet may slow prostate cancer progression and improve prognosis. In addition, specific plant foods, including flax seeds, parentheses, linseed, lycopene-rich tomatoes, yep, that's how I would say lycopene, and soya foods may help reduce the risk along with high level of physical activity. Organic tomato ketchup may contain up to three times as much lycopene as non-organic. Okay, so buy organic tomato ketchup. Cool. That's one good takeaway. All right, and now we're on to heart disease. The World Health Organization links heart disease to poor diets, high in saturated fats, salt and refined carbohydrates, and low in fruit and vegetables. Foods high in saturated fat include, oh, oh, it's glitching out a little bit. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Foods high in saturated fat include meat pies, sausage and fatty cuts of meat, butter, ghee, lard, cream, hard cheese, cakes and biscuits, and food containing coconut or palm oil. Coconut and palm oil, I'm pretty sure, are two of the only um, vegan oils that will actually increase your cholesterol. 
Other ones don't, but those two I believe still can. Replacing unhealthy saturated fat with healthier polyunsaturated fats may be more effective in lowering the risk of heart disease than reducing the total amount of fat in the diet. Soya protein, nuts, plant sterols, and soluble fibers found in oats and some fruit, vegetables, and pulses can all help lower cholesterol, which is a risk factor for heart disease. Vegans have lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, and a lower risk of heart disease and stroke. British vegetarians have a whopping 32% lower risk of hospitalization or death from heart disease than meat eaters. Cutting out the dairy component can only help. Diabetes. Early exposure to cow's milk proteins has been linked to type 1 diabetes. It is thought that certain proteins found in cow's milk may trigger an autoimmune reaction whereby our own immune cells attack those foreign dairy product, product sorry, proteins inadvertently destroying our insulin-producing pancreatic cells, thus leading to diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is occurring in younger and younger adults at, a level, at the level of a global epidemic, driven by the increasing burden of obesity. If the trend continues, the 2030, by 2035, the NHS could be spending nearly a fifth of its entire budget on diabetes alone. Um, the NHS is the National Health Service, I believe, so that's kind of like the, the healthcare in the UK. So, caused by obesity, poor diet, and lack of exercise, this disease is preventable and reversible. One obvious solution is to cut down on meat and dairy and increase fiber-rich fruit, vegetables, whole grain, pulses, nuts, and seeds. Vegan diets offer huge benefits for diabetes management, including weight loss, improving blood lipid, lipid profile, and glycemic control. Indeed, low-fat vegan diets have been shown to reverse type 2 diabetes. If you're interested in a lot of this health stuff, there is this book called How Not to Die by, I believe his name is Dr. Michael Greger. I will add a link to that in the description of this video as well. And the audiobook is really great, and I, I listened to that a while ago and I found that very informative. So if you are health motivated or even health curious, I cannot recommend that one highly enough. It goes over a lot of this stuff in far greater detail. All right, lactose intolerance. In 1836, after returning from the Beagle, Charles Darwin wrote, I have a very bad spell vomiting every day for 11 days and sometimes after every meal. Oh Lord, <laughs> to live in 1836. For over 40 years, Darwin suffered from long bouts of vomiting, stomach cramps, headaches, severe tiredness, skin problems, and depression. Research now suggests that he suffered from lactose intolerance. His case is a good example of how easily lactose intolerance can be missed. The ability to digest lactose, which is the sugar in milk, lactose is the sugar in milk, evolved as a result of genetic mutation along among some people in Central Europe around 7,500 years ago. Descendants of these people are able to drink cow's milk today without suffering the symptoms of lactose intolerance, bloating, wind, discomfort, etc. However, that doesn't mean it's good for them. Being lactose intolerant is a natural, normal state for most adults in the world. So this one, I do know uh, quite, I mean, I'm not gonna say quite a bit, but I, I do know about this one. And I do think it's very, very interesting. It's just another case of a situation where people have been sold this idea that we have all, not all, but so many people accept it with basically no question at all. Like lactose intolerance is the natural normal state for most adults in the world yet we like we call it lactose intolerance as if it's something wrong with you which is simply not the case yeah there's also like that theory that we can this is just a theory <laughs> i haven't read into this very much but i do find it interesting which is just that the reason that some people it says a genetic mutation in here but I also saw the theory that some people are able to tolerate lactose because there was a certain time at which it was just like genetically advantageous to be able to consume dairy. So like, for example, there was like an issue with water supply or just food in general and that people who were able to tolerate drinking milk from cows uh, had a better chance of surviving 
uh, in order to reproduce. And that is how lactose intolerance got passed on, but don't, don't quote me on that one. I need to research more about it. But I did think it was an interesting theory and just goes to show how little we know or think about these things as uh, regular people in society. All right, allergy versus intolerance. Lactose intolerance should not be confused with cow's milk allergy. They are entirely different. Cow's milk allergy is where the immune system reacts to proteins found in the milk, whereas lactose intolerance is where the body cannot digest lactose, the sugar in milk. Okay, so I knew they were different, but I wouldn't have been able to actually describe the difference. Cow's milk is where the immune system reacts to proteins in the milk, okay. Lactose intolerance is when the body cannot digest the sugar in the milk. Okay, bone health is the last one for this section. Those countries which consume the most dairy foods and animal protein have the highest hip fracture rates. Dairy products don't protect our bones. Despite what the dairy industry says, cow's milk is not the best source of calcium and your bone health would benefit enormously by switching to plant-based sources. In a study published in the British Medical Journal, it was suggested that it is time we revisited our calcium recommendations for young people and changed our assumptions about the role of calcium, milk, and other dairy products play in the bone health of children and adolescents. Physical, especially weight-bearing, exercise is the most critical factor for maintaining healthy bones, followed by improving diet and lifestyle. Yeah, it's interesting because I saw that there is sometimes like actually like a, a negative correlation, like people who consume more dairy have higher risk of bone fracture. I guess like it kind of said that just then, but that's another thing that I learned from How Not to Die. All right, here we go. Dairy's impact on the environment. Whew. Raising animals for food requires massive amounts of land, food, energy, and water and causes immense animal suffering. Impact on climate change. Globally, animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gases than all of the world's transportation systems combined. That's a lot. According to the United Nations, a global shift towards a vegan diet is necessary to combat the worst effects of climate change. So animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gases than all of the world's transportation systems combined. Yet so few environmentalists will talk about, you know, eliminating animal products from your diet, but they will tell you all about uh, a bicycle that you should be taking to work. <laughs> all right, enormous water usage. It takes an enormous amount of water to grow crops for animals to eat, clean filthy factory farms, and give animals water to drink. A single cow used for milk can drink up to 50 gallons of water per day, or twice that amount in hot weather. 50 gallons of water per day. That is so much water. And it takes 683 gallons of water to produce just one gallon of milk. It takes more than 2,400 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef, while producing one pound of tofu only requires 244 gallons of water. Wow, that's like 10%. By going vegan, one person can save approximately 219,000 gallons of water per year. That is a lot. That is a pretty compelling argument if you care about the environment. All right, unimaginable pollution. Animals raised for food in the U.S. produce many times more excrement than does the entire human population of the country. According to U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, animals on U.S. factory farms produce about 500 million tons of manure each year. With no animal sewage processing plants, it is, the most, it is most often stored in waste lagoons or it gets sprayed over fields. Runoff from factory farms and livestock grazing is one of the leading causes of pollution in our rivers and lakes. The EPA notes that bacteria and viruses can be carried by the runoff and that groundwater could be contaminated. Factory farms frequently dodge water pollution limits by spraying liquid manure into the air, creating mists that are carried away by the wind. People who live nearby are forced to inhale toxins and pathogens from the sprayed manure. A report by the California State Senate noted, studies have shown that animal waste lagoons emit toxic airborne chemicals that can cause inflammatory, immune, irritation, and neurochemical problems to humans. 
So this is another example where people will say, oh, you're vegan, like, what about people? Like, why don't you care about people? And they always say that as if you can't care about both, but this is just a great example of how veganism inherently also benefits humans because if we stop factory farming animals and spraying liquid manure into the air, uh, there will be scores of people who are benefited by not having to breathe the toxins and pathogens into their lungs in the air that they breathe. Like, carnism and consuming animal products is both anti-animal and anti-human. Alright, land usage. Using land to grow crops for animals is vastly inefficient. It takes almost 20 times less land to feed someone on a plant-based vegan diet than it does to feed a meat eater since the crops are consumed directly instead of being used to feed animals. According to the UN Convention to Combat Desert of I'm sorry. Desertification desertification, but it's desert, right? So it's it's probably still desertification. Okay. According to that convention, who are trying to combat that thing, desertification, it takes up to 10 pounds of grain to produce just one pound of meat. 10 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. And in the United States alone, 56 million acres of land are used to grow feed for animals, while only 4 million acres are producing plants for humans to eat. 56 for feeding animals, and then 4 million for humans to eat for plants for humans to eat that's a big difference all right the amazon rainforest more than 90 percent of all anim amazon rainforest land cleared since 1970 is used for grazing livestock 90 percent of all amazon rainforest land cleared since 1970 is used for grazing livestock i know a lot of people who need to hear that information which is like pretty much everybody in addition, one of the main crops grown in the rainforest is soybeans used for animal feed. How silly. The soybeans used in most veggie burger, tofu, and soy milk products sold in the United States are also grown in the United States. So the people who say that the Amazon rainforest is being cut down to grow soy on it, little do they know that the soy is actually grown for animals. So it is um, not vegans who are creating the demand for the Amazon rainforest to be cleared. All right, our oceans. While factory farms are ruining our land, commercial fishing methods such as bottom trawling and long lining often clear the ocean floor of all life and destroy coral reefs. They also kill thousands of dolphins, sea turtles, sharks, and other bycatch animals. Coastal fish farms release feces, antibiotics, parasites, and non-native fish into sensitive marine ecosystems. In addition, since most farmed fish are carnivorous, they are fed massive quantities of wild-caught fish. For example, it takes up to three pounds of fish meal to produce every pound of farmed salmon. So I'm not sure what this ocean section is doing in like the milk section, but... <laughs> Okay, maybe they're like front loading it because like more people will do like the earlier lessons. And so they're just like, they're just trying to get it all in. But yeah, so I'm, that our oceans part feels a little bit out of place, but it is still important and interesting. Okay, so it says down here, written by PETA, find the original article by clicking here. So I just filmed the video about PETA, so stay tuned for that. But it's interesting that they used a PETA Uh, article in its entirety. All right, so let's see. We're here on plant-based milk alternatives. My voice is starting to give out. Yeah, that's actually also part of the reason why I'm doing this is to like train my voice a little bit. Um, because like I said, I filmed that PETA video and by the end my voice was gone. Okay, let's dig in. Plant milks have been consumed for centuries in various cultures, but their popularity has skyrocketed over the past decade. People choose plant milks over dairy milk for a variety of reasons. Whether it is for their nutritional value, animal welfare reasons, lower environmental impact to avoid lactose or dairy milk allergens, or simply out of preference, there are many great options to try. Pro-Veg presents the 10 best non-dairy milk alternatives. All right, milk alternatives are growing in popularity, sound better. 
More and more consumers are questioning the consumption of cow's milk and the effects that our diets have on cows, the environment, and our health. This is also reflected in the increasing demand for non-dairy milk. Plants have been consumed for centuries in various cultures, but their popularity has skyrocketed over the past decade. The range of healthy milk vegan healthy vegan milk alternatives for drinking, cooking, and baking is huge. Some vegan milk alternatives have sugar added to them, but unsweetened options are also available. Okay. Let's go. So we're gonna go through all the different types here. So almond milk is rich in several healthy nutrients. Nutritionally, almond milk is quite different to soya or dairy milk. It has fewer calories and much less protein. The small amount of fat in almond milk is healthy, unsaturated fat. Homemade almond milk can be a rich source of calcium depending on the quantity of almonds used. It contains powerful antioxidants that can have a protective effect against cancer and heart disease. It has a mild and slightly nutty taste and is ideal for eating with cereals. Almond milk is less suitable for use in coffee as it has a flaky consistency. I don't know how liquid can be flaky, but okay. Uh, I do find that a cereal was the best use for almond milk when that was my milk of choice, but that was not for terribly long. Next we have oat milk is on the rise. Oat milk is slightly sweet with a thin consistency similar to low-fat milk. See, this might have been true, but oat milk has improved a lot in the last few years. Oat milk is now the most delicious milk in my opinion. Let me know what your favorite non-dairy milk is, but for me, definitely oat milk. Um, the extra creamy varieties. Even if I know they're not as healthy. I know soy milk is the best one because of the protein, but oat milk is just so good for a hot chocolate. All right. So it contains a moderate amount of calories and has more protein than most plant-based milks. It also has more fiber than other milks, which is important because it helps regulate digestion and can lower cholesterol. Oat milk has more carbohydrates and sugar than many other milks, even unsweetened, so it may not be the best choice for people with diabetes. It is suitable for cooking and baking. Cashew milk. Cashew milk has a slightly nutty taste and is suitable for cooking and baking. The fat contained is mostly heart-healthy, unsaturated fat and can be a great choice for people with diabetes who need to watch their carbohydrate intake. Cashew milk has only 2 grams of carbohydrates per cup. It's suitable for coffee and adds a thickness that would work wonderfully in lattes. I have enjoyed cashew milk in the past, but I don't buy it regularly. Coconut milk, a great choice for cooking. Coconut milk is for cooking is usually available in cans. It is ideal for cooking and baking, giving food a delicious aroma. Coconut milk is delicious in all kinds of recipes, from curries to vegetable soups, smoothies, chia seed pudding, and even ice cream. The thin coconut milk for drinking that comes in a cart carton is fantastic in a cup of coffee or on cereals. Hazelnut milk is a creamy treat for the palate. You know, I'm just gonna skip that one because I don't think a lot of people buy it. So we'll go on to hemp milk is a good source for omega-3 fatty acids. Hemp milk is made from the seeds of a hemp plant. It is low in carbohydrates and high in fat, but most of those are healthy, unsaturated fats. Just one glass of hemp milk can provide 50% of the recommended daily intake of alpha linolenic acid the omega-3 fatty acid, which helps support good heart health and brain function. It is suitable for cooking and baking and has a slightly nutty taste. I don't think I've ever tried hemp milk before. Macadamia nut milk, the fancy and delicious milk alternative. I have had this in the past and it is quite good, but I don't buy it anymore for no, I mean, I just like certain, certain other ones better now, honestly. Macadamia milk arrived on the scene much more recently than the other nut milks mentioned here and is still not widely available. This nut milk is low in calories but also very low in protein and carbohydrates. It tastes great on its own and is particularly suitable for desserts and coffee. Rice milk is the best choice for people with allergies. Rice milk is less likely to cause food allergies compared to any other milk because it is nut and gluten free. Uh, oat milk is also nut and gluten free, but okay. It has a naturally sweet taste and can be used for cooking and baking. Rice milk is extremely low in calories, which are mostly from carbohydrates, and has very little protein or fat. Since rice milk is a rather thin milk, it is less suitable for coffee. I am not a rice milk lover. Excuse me, not even a little bit, but whatever. Soy milk, the classic milk alternative. Of the non-dairy milks, one second. 
All right. Of the non-dairy milks, soy milk is the most nutritionally similar to cow's milk and is the most popular milk alternative so far. It is moderate in calories and a good source of protein and calcium. Soy milk contains compounds called isoflavins, isoflavins, we'll go with that, and phytosterols that can possibly lower the risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and osteoporosis. It is suitable for a wide range of purposes and can be used without restriction for cooking, baking, or in coffee and can even be foamed. As with cow's milk, soy milk is now available in various flavors such as vanilla, chocolate, or banana. Spelt milk? I'm gonna skip spell milk. I'm sorry if that's your favorite. Let me know in the comments if spelt milk is your favorite non-dairy milk. All right. So that was an article from ProVeg.com. And then at the bottom, we are gonna get here. So people often drink cow's milk for calcium. Using the graph above, you'll see that all plant milk, plant-based milks are a comparable source of calcium. For protein, soy milk is a comparable source, while other plant-based milks contain comparatively little protein. If you want to drink milk for its protein content, choose soy. Also, take note that everything on this list is has a plant-based source. Protein can be found in tofu, beans, tempeh, seitan, and more. Calcium can be found in leafy green vegetables, nuts, and, so and tofu. Yellow, red, and green vegetables, as well as fruit, have vitamin A. Rice contains vitamin B2. Foley is found in broccoli, Brussels sprouts, peas, and chickpeas. Vitamin E is found in nuts and seed. Z seeds. There are countless companies nowadays selling plant-based milks. You can check out the protein directory for a comprehensive list of all the companies developing milk alternatives, as well as other food companies producing alternatives to animal products. So I'm also curious if you are vegan, if you would drink um, lab grown milk, because I have like had a bite of like the Brave Robot cultivated milk where it's like biologically the same as cow's milk but there's no animals involved so it's vegan and cruelty free but it's still technically milk and it gave me the heebie-jeebies i'm telling you like i also i had the chance to try like the cultured milk cream cheese and i'm not i'm not trying to yuck anyone's yum i think it is vegan i think it is fine to eat but like i I could not bring myself to put it in my mouth. I don't think that it's gonna be for me. And especially because a lot of those uh, health risks that we talked about, I'm curious if the plant milks, or sorry, not the plant milks, the cultivated uh, dairy products have the hormones in them. I don't, I don't know how that works. So if you do know, please tell me down below, you know where to put it. But I don't know off the top of my head. So I am a no-go on the cultivated dairy stuff at this time. But yeah, I don't know a lot about like the health like risks for the lab stuff versus like stuff that actually comes out of a cow or a goat or whatever animal we're talking about. All right, a voice is starting to go, but we're gonna power through. We're like at the end. <laughs> The sustainability of plant-based milks. So this is for all those people who like to complain about almond milk and being, uh, you know, it being unsustainable, which is nonsense, spoiler alert. All right. Numerous scientific studies show that the greenhouse gas emissions used in the production of plant-based milks are far lower than for dairy milk. But which milk has the smallest impact on the planet? Looking at the global averages illustrated in the chart below, producing a glass of dairy milk results in almost three times the greenhouse emissions of any non-dairy milks, according to a University of Oxford study. Looking at land use, the difference is starker still. All right, now we've got this little like chart here. It says, which milk should I choose? And then this is the environmental impact of one glass, 200 milliliters of different milks. All right, so the emissions for dairy milk are still huge and the emissions oh wow so water use okay so we can see that this is where people will protest and they say that the water use of almonds is catastrophic like they'll tell you all about how like almond milk is destroying the environment it's using up all of the water they especially complain about the ones in california but look look at look at this look at the difference Dairy is still higher. I would say that that's like, let's try and go straight up here. It's like between 
50 and 30 percent more <laughs> sorry i got my i got my percentages mixed up but it's clearly obvious that dairy milk uses so much more water than the almond milk like come on people pull it together all right producing a glass of dairy milk every day for a year requires 650 square meters or 7,000 square feet of land the equivalent of two tennis courts and more than 10 times as much as the same amount of oat milk according to the study so one glass of dairy milk every day for a year is two tennis courts of space which is 10 times more than the same amount of oat milk okay that's like not visually immediately very clear to me but so I think by that math, we can say that it takes two tennis courts worth of land to create 365 days worth of milk and one fifth. Math is not my strong suit. So if we have 10 times as much, okay, so if the oat milk is 10 times as much, so then five, five, eh. Moving on, <laughs> moving on. So either way, oat milk is far better for land usage than dairy milk. All right, what about water usage for milk production? Almond milk requires more water to produce than soy or oat milk. True, we saw that in the chart. A single glass requires 74 liters or 130 pints of water, more than a typical shower. Wow, oh, that's quite a lot, but not as much as the dairy milk. Do not let them fool you. Rice milk is also comparatively thirsty, requiring 54 liters of water per glass. However, it's worth noting that both almond milk and rice milk still require less water to produce than the typical glass of dairy milk. People tend to underestimate the greenhouse gas emissions from food, and dairy milk is no exception, according to research by Dr. Adrian Camilleri, a psychologist at the University of Technology, Sydney. The greenhouse gas emissions from milk are 30 times higher than that of what people estimate, he told BBC News. Wow, 30 times higher than people estimate. I suspect that most consumers underestimate the greenhouse gas emissions saved by switching from dairy milk to plant-based milks such as soy milk. All right, last chunk. What about other comparable impacts? However, this information spurs more questions when it comes to sustainability. What about the deforestation due to soy? When worrying about deforestation, soy for human consumption is not the culprit, just like we talked about earlier. Only 6% of soybeans are grown for human consumption, while 70% are used to feed livestock. 70% for livestock and 6% for, for humans. Where's like the other 24% going? Where's 24% going? Because that's humans and animals. What else What else do we use soy for? Somebody, if you know, I'd love to know. All right, we have 24% of soy is unaccounted for. It's MIA. Okay. The WWF, which is the World Wildlife Foundation, I believe, reports that 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is due to cattle ranching and the soy production for cattle feed. If you want to stand against deforestation instead of boycotting soy, boycott meat and dairy love it all right so here are cute animals we'll watch like one of these <laughs> that is cute that's very cute baby cows are just like a special kind of adorable aren't they oh okay let's uh Let's do one more. <laughs> yeah, that's very... Although they still have a tag in their ear. I don't love that. Are we sure that this animal is, like, safe? I don't like that. That's giving me the ick. If I'm gonna, like, watch a cute video of an animal, I have to feel, like, very secure in the fact that, like, they're living a good life. Otherwise, it, like, ruins the experience for me. So, the cows... Oh, no. See, these, these cows have tags, too. I don't like that. Maybe I'll write them an email. Um, by them, I mean vegan boot camp. But maybe that's too far. I don't know. So, um, I have seen Dairy is Scary. If you have not, I recommend you watch it. I'm not going to watch it now because that's something you can do on your own time. But it is a great video. 
So it looks like I'm just gonna skip through this bonus material. So here's a video on James Aspie. And this looks like some more. And oh, how to make oat milk. I just, I just buy oat milk. Okay, what is the biggest cause for deforestation in the Amazon? This is a fun, this is a fun little thing that happens here. Oh, it's not even showing over there on my screen. All right, my bad. It's like putting little squares, not important. Cattle ranching is the biggest cause of deforestation in the Amazon. Next, select the sentence that's true. Cows are killed around the age of five when they become useless to the industry but can live up to 25 years. Cows are killed at the age of, th okay, I already know that, that one's correct. Cows are killed at the age of five when they become useless to the industry but can live up to 25 years. Which plant-based milk has a similar amount of protein to dairy milk? And the options are rice, soy, or coconut. And the answer is soy. Select the sentence that's not true. Animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gases than all of the world's transportation combined. We know that one's true. More than 90% of all Amazon rainforest land cleared since 1970 is used for grazing livestock. I believe that one's also true. And then we have humans have been drinking milk for millions of years since we were able to stand and walk on two legs. It's that one. And then cows don't produce milk unless they've given birth. That one's also true, which means C is the one that is not true. Are plant-based milks more sustainable than cow's milk? And our options are yes, all plant-based milks are more sustainable on all grounds. And then we have B, which is no, most nut milks use more water than cow's milk. And then C, no, cow's milk isn't less sustainable than plant-based milk. So the answer is obviously A, which is that all plant-based milks are more sustainable on all grounds. So remember that next time somebody tries to come at you for almond milk, which is honestly kind of an outdated plant milk anyways. Most people I know drink oat or soy. So yeah, screw those, those people for real. Not the people who drink soy and, all, and oat milk, but the people who like complain about almond milk. Oh my gosh, we did it. We've completed dairy milk. That took so much longer than I expected. All right, talk about a lot of reading. For real, my voice is going again. Congrats. Your mission is to find five plant-based milks and buy one of each. Okay, so this is your mission. Your mission is to find five plant-based milks and buy one of each. We recommend the following five. Oat milk, soy milk, almond milk, cashew, and coconut. We recommend avoiding the sweetened varieties, but they usually don't carry a good taste just by themselves. What? We recommend avoiding the unsweetened varieties as they usually don't carry a good taste just by themselves, but mix it up if you're not sure. That sentence doesn't make sense to me. Whatever. Once you find a few that you like, make the switch and commit to never buying or drinking cow's milk again. Great job. Already there. Done that a long time ago. But if you're not vegan or if you don't already have a favorite plant milk, I think that's probably a good challenge. Just go buy a bunch. Try it. All right. Done. Complete this course. My voice is gone. But that's part of this is like learning to build up my voice because I feel like I should be able to talk for more than like an hour and 10 minutes uh, without losing my voice. So that's hopefully going to be a positive benefit of this, as well as getting better at externalizing my thoughts. So thank you for being here for the uh, the first two lessons of the vegan boot camp. I hope you have learned something. If you have, write it in the comments. If you knew all of this, also tell me in the comments. Because while I would say I knew most of the broad strokes, there was still some interesting information for me in there. So stay tuned for the next lesson, which is going to be cheese. So yeah, we'll see what that's about. We'll see if it's as long. I feel like we covered a lot of like the basic ground in the dairy milk one, but let's take a look at some of the ones that are to come. So we also have eggs, honey, and then, oh, Dominion. Just like watch Dominion is one. We're not going to be doing that one here, but you should still watch Dominion, link in the description. All right, and then we have meat, cosmetics. I'm pretty interested in cosmetics because like as soon as I learned that animal testing was bad, I was just like, oh, animal testing is bad. So I've only bought cruelty-free products since then. So we'll see um, on that one. Clothing should be also interesting as well. I saw one down here, activism. Curious about that one as a, you know, aspirational activist. And same with effective vegan outreach. Oh, they're also going to do like funding kids. I'm, I'm very interested in the concept of veganism and children because I am personally 
uh, a child-free individual <laughs> who is not convinced that having children is necessarily the right thing to do. And I think that it might conflict with veganism in a lot of ways. So very curious for that section. So like I said, stick around for those. It will remain to be seen if they're all gonna be as long as the dairy milk one. But again, thank you for being here. Subscribe to the channel to see more. And I will see you in the next installment of Vegan Bootcamp. Thank you and goodbye.